Good morning and welcome to worship with First Presbyterian Church on this Lord's Day. We are pleased to gather on this Sunday morning to celebrate God moving in our midst. Even while we may be separated through screens, we know that God Spirit binds us together in this time and in this day. Friends, let us give thanks to God for this day and worship with our whole hearts and sing together our opening hymn. Brothers and sisters, with hope in the mercies of God, let us confess our sins before God and one another. We pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have conformed our lives to the ways of the world and not the ways of your kingdom. We think of ourselves too highly and regard others as lowly. We exalt possessions and power when you alone are to be exalted. We let conflicts prevail over grace and divisions over your beloved peace. Have mercy upon us, we pray. Forgive and transform us that we may be holy and acceptable to you, discerning and doing your will. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Friends, the mercy and the love is steadfast. 
the forgiveness and grace of God is offered to you on this day and every day. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. In Jesus Christ, we know God's forgiveness and God's peace. At this time, please share the peace of Christ with one another. Feel free to type it into the comments of our live stream. Share that peace with those gathered around you and know that Christ's peace moves among this time and place. Friends, may the peace of Christ be with you. Good morning, friends. I really miss seeing your faces on Sunday morning. And though there are many hard things about this time with COVID, we do have a chance to do things in this virtual worship that we wouldn't be able to do in our sanctuary. And one of those things is showing a video that everybody can see. So to explore our Bible story this morning, I would like to share this fun and interesting video that was produced by Hadar, which is a Jewish educational institution. Let's watch and listen. Meet Shifra and Pua. When we first see them at the beginning of the Exodus story, they're introduced as humble midwives. Hameyaladot ha'ivriot. This can mean the Israelite midwives or the midwives of the Israelites, which is a very important difference. They help mothers deliver babies, and they're important here because Paro's murderous plan to kill the Israelite baby boys involves midwives. He tells them, here's what you have to do. When an Israelite woman is giving birth, check to see if it's a boy or a girl. If it's a boy, kill it. Tell her that the baby was born dead. If it's a girl, let it live. Initially, we have every reason to think the midwives will go ahead with this plan. Paro has the power to kill people. He's able to afflict an entire nation. It would take a lot of courage to stand up to Paro, but that's exactly what Shifra and Pua do. The Torah tells us that they feared God, and because of that, they let the babies live. When Paro confronts them, they bravely lie, telling him that by the time they get to the Israelite women, they've already given birth and haven't had the opportunity to carry out the orders. Paro is forced to move to his next plan to throw the baby boys into the Nile. But who knows how many babies Shifra and Pua managed to save in the meantime? There are two traditional ways to read the story of Shifra and Pua. In the first read, Shifra and Pua are themselves actual Israelite women. They're standing up for their friends and family, willing to risk death so that their people don't suffer. The confusing part of seeing them as Israelites is why Paro would have thought they'd carry out his plan at all. One possible reason, Paro assumes that everyone is afraid of him, and he doesn't think that people have courage of their own or that they're willing to take a stand for what they believe is right. Another possible reason is that historically, the Israelites haven't always been great about protecting each other. After all, the way the Israelites wound up in Egypt in the first place was because Yosef's brothers sold him into slavery. Maybe Paro figures that this is a people who don't look out for each other. Shifra and Pua are the first to prove that maybe that's not true. The second way of reading the story and the phrase Hamiyaladot Ha'ivriot is that Shifra and Pua are Egyptian midwives who help Israelite women give birth. In some ways, this reading of the story makes a lot more sense. Of course, Paro would assume that Egyptian midwives would be willing to carry out his order and kill Israelite babies. Why would they not? Like the rest of the Egyptians, Paro figures these midwives are afraid of the Israelites and willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that they're controlled. In this reading of the story, Shifra and Pua's active resistance is a little less obvious, but deeply important. It shows us that all Egyptians are not the same. There are some, like Paro and the Taskmasters, who are willing to do whatever it takes to maintain power and control. But there are others, like Shifra and Pua and like Bat Paro, like Paro's daughter herself, who rescues baby Moshe from the Nile. 
These Egyptians fear God and are willing to look out for babies and vulnerable women and are willing to take chances with their own lives rather than go against their own consciences. Who do you think Shifra and Pua Hamielidota Ivriot are? Israelites who saw their chance to stand up for their community? Or Egyptians who knew what they were commanded to do was wrong? Either way, this act of courage is what sets the whole story of the Exodus, the Israelites' freedom from slavery, into motion. So what do you think? Were Shifra and Pua Hebrews or Egyptians? Or more importantly for me, how did they get to be so brave? I sometimes worry that when it's my time to stand up for what is right, I may feel shy or be scared and not do the right thing. It has certainly happened to me. I think being brave takes practice, doing little things to stay ready. It's not easy to be the one who says, hey guys, that's mean, don't do that. Or, hey, that new kid is all alone, let's go see if they wanna hang out. I hope this week you will wonder about the story of Shifra and Pua and start to practice bravely standing up for what is right. Let's pray together. Great big God of love, we thank you for the story of Shifra and Pua. Take away our fears. Help us be bold and brave with your love. Help us stand up for what is right. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. told you that what you do this week would change the world. It's true. In big ways and small ways, you have that power, that power of change, that power to transform. We believe in a God of transformation and hope, of new life and perseverance, who uses each of us to bring forth the work of the kingdom of God. Today, we meet Shifra and Pua, two women who knew God and served God in their actions and the way that they lived their lives. Let's hear the scripture from Exodus chapter one and listen to God's word to us on this morning. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, of whom one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women, you see them and you see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. 
But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them. But when they let the boys, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, in whom we live and move and have our being. Amen. Shifra and Pua, the midwives, these are women who worked to bring life, to usher it forth into the world. They didn't know that they were changing the world by doing so and setting a course for the deliverance of the Israelites out of the land of Egypt with their actions. What they did know is that they believed in God and they couldn't do this evil thing that was asked of them. Now, we've been talking these past few weeks about the stories of Joseph from Genesis. And those stories ended with his whole family settling in the land of Egypt. That Pharaoh had made space for Joseph and the God of Joseph. But over time, their otherness, their difference became a threat. Pharaoh feared the Hebrew people and wanted the Egyptians to fear them as well as much as he did. So he commanded the midwives, these life bringers, to be life takers and do these evil deeds, punishing the children with their very lives. I remember a conversation I had a few years ago about this passage. My friend, she was asking, she was lamenting, where is God in this story, in this evil plan, in this plot? Well, let's ask, where do you think God is? Uh, God, God. I've been taught that you have a special connection with the Pharaoh and you speak more directly to him than anyone else. Yes, I know that's what you have been taught, but look, you are talking to me right now. So I am. And you talk to me when you are in the birthing rooms. I definitely do that. uh, Shipra and I both do that. So what's on your mind, Pua? Well, You probably know this already, but we were just summoned by Pharaoh, and he is really frightened about something. He didn't say that, but I could just sense it. And and he must be really mad at the people we serve, the Hebrews, because he, well, he commanded us to do something so horrible, I almost can't bring myself to say it. I mean, we spend our whole lives seeking to bring new life into this world, yet so often we have, we lament a mother and a child for whom we can do nothing. And he just told us to kill the baby boys, only let the little girls live. How can he be so cruel? What are you going to do about it? What do you mean? I mean, what are you going to do about this? Me? You. No, you. You are going to do something about it.
Can't you stop Pharaoh? You and Shifra have the power to stop this from happening. We do? Yes. Really? Yes. I, I'm going to need a lot of courage. Yes. I'm a, I'm a little afraid. Yes. He's going to find out. Yes, Pharaoh, we'll find out. What will we say to him when he does? You'll find the words. Okay. Good. Shifra and Pua made a decision. They took a chance and realized they had it in them to stop this evil plot. They defied Pharaoh, not knowing what it would cost them nor who they would save. But at the time, they probably weren't thinking revolutionary acts of change, but let's just do this next right thing. Let's save this next baby and the next one and the one after that. And these actions, though, they set a course for the salvation of the Hebrew people from slavery. They refused to buy into Pharaoh's fear and power grasp and continued to serve God with the work of their hands and the strength of their convictions. Pharaoh then though, intensifies his evil plan. Let's hear of what happens next, what brave women will do to counter him in Exodus chapter 1, verse 22 through 2, verses 10. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, let every boy that is born in to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. And she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds of the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to it. Then she opened it and saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the, women, the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses because, she said, I drew him out of the water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. These women, too, trying, trying with what they have in the moment to act faithfully. And it's in these simple acts, simple faithful acts of defiance that they are attempting to bear witness to justice in the moment. Decisions, big and small, in this story, 
with these women help us to see how the actions of faithful people can change the world that we live in. Each action, each decision that we make has the power to affect good in this world, to live into God's calls of justice, to lift up the life and well-being of those around us. But each action and each decision we make also has the power to harm, to harm others, to harm ourselves, to harm the environment, to harm the cause of justice. The things that we do this week, this day even, our actions and decisions and choices will ripple out with consequences foreseen and unforeseen. So my original, original question for today shouldn't, be, shouldn't really be whether we will change the world, but how will we change the world in these days to come, this week, this month, this season, this year? What will we do to make a difference in the world? Some of our actions may be big and bold and courageous. Some may be small and hardly noticeable, yet they all have the potential to ripple out, affecting countless lives. Yesterday, it was Shifra and Pua with their power standing up to a bully and a tyrant. Who will it be today? Who will it be tomorrow? How will we continue to serve the God that we know stands on the side of the marginalized and the side of the oppressed? A God who we know loves justice and who we know loves us deeply and redeems us and offers us grace and new life time and again. What actions and decisions will we make today and tomorrow that live into this knowledge and this story, into the legacy of those midwives so long ago? Perhaps you are thinking, well, I don't really deal in life and death matters. I don't really think I have the power to make that kind of difference in the world. But you do. Now, in this moment, in these days, we're dealing with life and death so clearly during the time of this global pandemic. And the small choices that we make add up. This week, I was waiting for uh, my COVID test results, which thankfully came back negative. But during that time, those choices that we were making, all of it held risks and decisions to weigh out. Gosh, in these days, every choice we make can be life and death. This is clear more in these days than, than ever before. Now, my point today is not just that Shifra and Pua are some fierce Old Testament ladies whose story I love and I hope you learn to love too, which they are and I do. But the point is that these women and Moses' mother and sister and Pharaoh's daughter, all of them, they seemingly didn't have a lot of power in the world or status, but they still found ways to serve God with their lives, in their actions and their choices, and for the midwives and their vocation. They bear witness to the mothering power of God, this God that works through them, this God whose will for life overrides death whose power for life is undeterred by earthly rulers, who set up systems uh, undeterred by those who would set up systems for personal gain or power or benefit, not knowing God, not striving to find God's purposes for their people and for their lives. We must seek to be on the side of God's love and God's justice with our choices and our actions. Be in conversation with God about it. Like our scene earlier today, we'll find the words and the courage to plant those seeds of justice. Each choice and action set the course for 
the way that we choose to be in the world. And those all add up to a life lived in one way or another. So what are the things that we're being asked to do today? Little things. We're being asked to wear masks, to stay physically distant, even when it's hard to do so. We're being asked to affirm that black lives matter. They do very much. We're being asked to see one another as brothers and sisters in this work of racial justice. We're being asked to join God's work in eradicating poverty and dismantling the systems of racism and oppression that threaten human dignity. There's this poem that is in the memory of Archbishop Oscar Romero, who was assassinated while preaching the gospel and speaking out, who spoke out against the violence of the El Salvadorian government against his own people. This poem reads, We accomplish in our lifetime only a fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. This is what we are about. We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water the seeds already planted knowing that they hold future promise. We cannot do everything. And there is a sense of liberation in realizing this. This enables us to do something and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and to do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders, ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future, not our own. We, each of us, are called in into God's work in this world. The steps that we take, the actions we pursue, all of this works towards the future that we create together. Be a part of making this world one where the love of neighbor is lifted up. Where refusing to allow violence and unjust policies and systems to mandate the oppression of a people. Let us be a part of making this world that we, making this world be one that we want to be in and be a part of. A world where we meet God in every person. Affirming that human life is created in the very image of God. Shifra and Pua knew this to be true. They knew God and they knew what they had to do. So friends, think about the seeds we are planting. With each decision we make, with each decision we make and each action we pursue. May it be so. Amen.
We have just a few announcements this morning. The first is that we will hold a Zoom conversation and coffee hour immediately following the worship service today. The link you can find, it should be on uh, the post that was made uh, just before worship today in the comments there is a Zoom link. So please join us immediately following worship today. Our soup kitchen and clothes closet are operating in a to-go model. Uh, soup and lunch is available beginning at about 12.30 as well as the clothes closet um, at, at about 12.30 from, um, from our church building here. We are pleased, very pleased, to welcome to our staff Chip Houston, who is uh, will be working as our office manager um, in this. We are just so excited to have him join our team. And um, with that being said, please uh, look forward in your inboxes to our weekly newsletter, which will be able to resume again. It should be coming around at a, on Thursday of this week. If you have any announcements, it's been a while since we've had our weekly newsletter, so if you have any announcements or things that should be included, please email chip, C-H-I-P, at firstpresmemphis.org, and he will, um, he will do his best to get it into the email. You should do that before noon on Tuesday so that we can make sure that um, we have uh, time to get that, get that together. And with that, um, I believe those are all of our announcements for today. So uh, as we think about our time of offering, here are some words from the book of Romans. God has given us gifts to share, prophetic acts and acts of service, teaching and leading, encouragement, diligence, and cheerfulness. Giving without strings attached. Freely then, let us open our hearts, our hands, and our resources to a world in need. Let us pray. Steadfast God, your love and your faithfulness are with us always. We give thanks to you that there is no end to our hope. By your power, we know that all things will be restored. Therefore, we pray with confidence to you who are above all things, who are within all things, that you take notice of those who cry out for your love and your mercy. We ask that your presence be known to those who are in the midst of trouble. To anyone in despair, send your deliverance swiftly. For those longing for home, return them, we pray, to a place of safety and of love. For those estranged from one another in this distant time, we pray that your love and your presence be a comfort. Loving God, your promise to comfort your promise of comfort in to those in sorrow, may it help to be a comfort to us and to those who are in troubled times. Lift each one up so that they might see your salvation. We ask that you be especially now with our sister Vicki in the hospital now recovering and for those who are sick and ill, we ask that your healing presence be known in the hospitals and with the doctors and the nurses who seek to bring your healing. 
we ask for strength and courage in this seemingly unending season of pandemic and illness and disease. We ask, O oh God, that you help us and you help the nations to learn your justice and to practice it. Silence the deafening drumbeat of war so that we might learn a song of thanksgiving. We desire to be better caretakers of your people, O oh God. Break our hearts open with injustice, that we may be doers of justice, actors of love, bringers of peace, and generous servants in your world, in our communities, in our homes, and in our daily lives. We thank you, O oh God, for the gift of the church and for the varied gifts of this, the people among us. We ask that you enlarge our witness in the world in small acts and in large ones. We thank you, O oh God, that we might come to you in prayer. And we pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now sing our closing hymn. Go out into this day and serve God. Serve God in each and every action that, that you do. And as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. 
May the Lord be kind and gracious to you, and may the Lord's face shine upon you and grant you peace on this day and forevermore. Amen. Be with you till we meet.